everyone. Uh, in this lecture, I will discuss the second school of uh, the Mahayana tradition, which is the Yogachar school. You will notice great similarities between the Madhimika and the Yogachara school as far as their conception of Nirvana goes or the non-existence of the phenomenal world goes. There are even stories pertaining to the emergence of the Yogachara school out of the Madhimika school. As some scholars say that when Nagarjuna was heading the Buddhist school at Nalanda, there arose some disputes among his disciples uh, which ultimately led to the emergence of a new system of thought by the name Yogachar. Anyway, uh, that is probably just a story. I am not too sure about it. So, uh, the Yogachar school originated after the Madhimika school. This can be inferred from the fact that um, Nagarjuna, the founder of the Madhimika school, belongs to uh, the 2nd century CE, whereas um, founders of the Yogachar school, Asanga and his brother Vasubandhu, belong to the 4th century CE. Actually, uh, if we go by the tradition, uh, it is Maitreya, the teacher of Asanga, who is the actual founder of the school. Maitreya is also believed to be a contemporary of Nagarjuna. Now, uh, we need to understand a few points. One, that they do accept the empirical reality of categories called Samriti Satya. Second, with regard to the Paramarthic Satya, they have their own interpretation of the doctrine of emptiness which, uh, which uh, we may on the face of it call a deviation from the Madhimika school. Third, they claim that the ultimate reality is consciousness and which is why this school is also known by uh, the name Vijnanavada, where Vijnana stands for consciousness. And the objects of the empirical world, uh, which appear to be material and outside of consciousness, are actually ideas or states of consciousness. Peter Harvey, uh, in his book um, An Introduction to Buddhism, states that uh, the intention of uh, the school is not to propound a mere philosophical viewpoint, but to develop a perspective uh, which will uh, uh, facilitate enlightenment. And uh, let us find out if uh, this actually is the case. It is believed that the name Yogachar was given to this system by Asanga while the label Vignanavad is ascribed to Vasubandhu. The word Yogachar suggests uh, two kinds of practices. First, concerns those yogic practices uh, through which one elevates himself from the state of gross worldly objects to a state where there is no perception. That is, uh, a state where uh, the phenomenal world ceases to exist. Second, concerns the duties which a bodhisattva must perform. So, a bodhisattva belonging to the Yogachar tradition meditates on Shunyata and fulfills the six paramitas or perfections of Dana, Shila, Shanti, Virya, Dhyana and Pragna. And as I just mentioned, this school is also known by the name Vijnanavad, uh, the name given by Vasubandhu perhaps, because uh, of the claim that Vijnana or consciousness is the only reality. Now, from the claim that everything that exists is mental or consciousness only, uh, we infer that uh, the Yogachar school is putting forward a form of idealism. 
So, Vasubandhu, we may say, is uh, more interested in bringing out the speculative side of this philosophy. If you remember, I discussed Vasubandhu in my earlier lecture on the Sautrantika and the Vaibhashika schools. So, Vasubandhu is a significant name in the tradition. As I said, he is the younger brother of Asanga. He initially was a Sarvasti uh, Vadin, uh, but uh, supposedly his brother influenced him to join the Mahayana sect. Uh, there are many important works that are attributed to, um, uh, to Vasubandhu. Uh, for example, uh, Vimshatika or, or the 20 verses, uh, then there is uh, Trimshika or the 30 verses. Uh, it is believed that uh, Vasubandhu used to give discourses and lectures during the daytime. That was probably his livelihood. Then in the evening time, he would pen down those lectures in the shape of verses. Ultimately, he made a compilation of 600 verses. And this compilation was called Abhidharma Kosh, which is considered as one of the most important books in the Buddhist tradition, as uh, Vasubandhu discusses all the different schools of Buddhism in this book. So, uh, now coming back to the Yogacara philosophy. The Yogacharans have uh, advanced uh, some interesting doctrines like three turnings of uh, the wheel of dharma, uh, vigyapti matra or cognition only, then uh, three svabhava or three self nature and ashta vignana or the system of eight consciousness. All these doctrines are contained in the uh, Samdhi Nirmochana Sutra, which is considered as the first Yogachar text. There are a series of dialogues in the Sutra between uh, Buddha and the Bodhisattvas. Here, the Buddha clarifies his teachings so that there is no dispute left uh, with regard to them. Now, Turning of the wheel of dharma means teaching the dharma. Buddha is said to have turned the wheel of dharma three times. And the Yogachar system is associated with the third turning of the dharma wheel. The first turning of the wheel uh, pertains to the teaching of uh, the shravaka or the disciple. Here, the Shravaka is expected to regard the Buddha as his teacher and follow the teachings of the Buddha, which include the Four Noble Truths, Shunyata or emptiness of the phenomenal world and pursuing Nirvana. The second turning of the wheel pertains to emphasizing Shunyata or emptiness. The Samdhi Nirmochana Sutra claims that um, uh, these are the authentic doctrines given in the uh, Pragna Paramita Sutras. But uh, since there were some errors regarding their interpretation, a third turning of the wheel was required to uh, clarify the doctrines. And this pertains to Chitta Matra or mind only or consciousness only and what this suggests is that the source of both the content of our perception and the mental factors which perceive that content is the same. Now according to Yogacara, there cannot be any absolute opposition between thinking subject and world of objects which he thinks. Thought is the beginning and the end of all knowledge. Remove thought, all will vanish into nothing. The individual who thinks is not merely an individual, he is part of all he knows. And all he knows is part of him. Thought is the only reality we have uh, to reckon with. It is the structure as well as the stuff of reality. 
it knows only so far as it thinks itself to be the object of its knowledge. Thought contains everything in itself. The world with its diversity is a mental construct of a being whose mind has stored up various ideas, desires and some misapprehensions from yawns ago. And likewise, uh, for each individual, this world is his own mental creation, which is the result of the storehouse of the karmic impressions he has accumulated during his several existences. The Yogacara claim that uh, there are three ways to perceive the world or as they call the three natures of perception. They are Parikalpita which literally means fully conceptualized or imaginary nature wherein things are incorrectly apprehended based on conceptual construction through attachment and erroneous discrimination. Then there is Paratantra which literally means other dependent or dependent nature by which the correct understanding of the dependently originated nature of things is understood. Then there is Parinispanna, which literally means fully accomplished or absolute nature, through which one apprehends things as they are in themselves uninfluenced by any conceptualization at all. So, as opposed to the Madhimikas, the Yogacharins do not deny samsara as non-existent. They do attribute some reality to it uh, only in so far as its true reality is not discovered. The erroneous mental construction exists but ultimately the error is realized uh, as unreal. And the one who realizes the unreality never makes mistakes again. The Parikalpita Swabhav of objects is due to certain causes and conditions or their Paratantra Swabhav. However, the realization of Shunyata is the highest truth. Uh, it is Parinispanna. It is the same as Vigyapti Matrata. To understand Shunyata or Vigyapti Matrata, let us understand the first verse of Vasubandhu's Vimshatika. Now it says, this world is Vigyapti Matra, since it manifests itself as an unreal object, just like the case of those with cataracts seeing unreal hairs in the moon and the light. Mark Sideritz clarifies what Vasubandhu means here. So, according to Vasubandhu, we are only ever aware of mental images or impressions which manifest themselves as external objects. But there is actually no such thing outside the mind. And Vasubandhu claims that resting in Vigyapti Matrata is Nirvana. So, you must understand that this school is popular more because of its impressive epistemology. If you remember uh, my lecture on the Sotrantika epistemology, uh, you would know that they advanced uh, a theory of perception uh, which may be labeled as representationalism. The view that in our sensory perceptions, we are only directly aware of the external object. Um, uh, we are not actually, we are not directly aware of uh, the external object, but rather with the mental image resembling the external object. And this mental image is caused by the external object, which of course uh, exists independently of our minds. So basically the Sotrantika view holds that uh, we infer the existence of the external object or that we are indirectly aware of the external object. 
Vasubandhu, however, challenges this theory and thereby brings his own theory of perception, which is again uh, explained as Vigyapti Matra. I wish to borrow Mark Sidrit's uh, translation for Vigyapti Matra as impressions only to explain Vasubandhu's theory of perception. Impression is a mental image or uh, the intentional object for Vasubandhu, just as representation is a mental image for the Sautrantika. So, while the representationalist uh, is a realist, the impressions only theorist is an idealist. The representationalist upholds the existence of an external object, whereas the impressions only theorist denies the existence of the external object. But despite this difference, they both agree that in a sensory perception, we are directly aware of a mental image. I discussed the representationalist view in my previous lecture, so I will not talk about it further. So let us get back to the verse from the Vimshatika to prove that only impressions exist. Now, this world is nothing but impressions since it manifests itself as an unreal object. Just like the case of those with cataracts seeing unreal hairs in the moon and the like. Now, what this means is that when someone suffering from cataract looks at the moon, he sees hairs on the moon. But obviously, there are no hairs on the moon. Then what does this man see since he is directly aware of something? He sees a mental image or an impression which manifests itself as hairs in the moon. Vasubandhu explains that external objects are no more than mental images. He does not dismiss the cognitive um, objects, but he definitely rejects their existence anywhere else than in the very act of consciousness which apprehends them. And thus, he builds the argument, the content of a sensory experience presents itself as an external object when no such object exists. Anything presenting itself as an external object when no such objects, uh, object exists is only an impression like the hairs on the moon seen by one with cataracts. Therefore, the contents of sensory experience are only impressions. So, in our perceptual experiences, we are directly aware of the impressions only and these impressions are not to be confused with representations as representations point to an external object. But here, there is no external object, no hairs in the moon, no reference in the external world. All perceptual experiences take place in the mind or consciousness only. It is a mistake to believe that uh, things which we perceive or have perceived in the past are outside the sphere of consciousness. A realist may counter this argument by saying that Vasubandhu is only begging the question instead of uh, uh, providing a proof for the non-existence of the external physical objects. So, the realist may argue like this. He would say, if an impression is devoid of external object, then it should be without spatial and temporal determination. Let us understand what these criticisms are about. If we talk, uh, say, about uh, the impressions, color and shape, then these impressions appear somewhere. And precisely this appearance of the color and shape at a particular place suggests that there exists an object to which the shape and color belong. 
Had there not been an external object, the appearance of the color and shape at a specific point could not be explained. And further, uh, color and shape would appear everywhere. Also, the color and shape appears in the mental stream of a person at a particular time, not always. So, this clearly proves that there is an external object with spatio-temporal determinations. So, let us come to the second argument uh, which the realists give. Impressions should be without determination, impression should be without determination in the mental stream of the perceiver and it should not have efficacy. What this point proves is that all those who have a sensory experience of an object have the same kind of experience of something appearing at a particular place and time. That is to say, they share similar experiences. How can that be explained with an impressions only theory? Also, every sense experience is causally efficacious. That is, it gives rise to something. And this again cannot be explained if there is no external object. Now, anticipating all these criticisms, Vasubandhu responds to them. And these responses are given in Vimshatika. To counter the argument regarding spatio-temporal determination of an object, uh, Vasubandhu uses the dream argument. He states that in dreams, mental images do appear to be determined by space as well as time. So, in the case with the wake, uh, and so is the case with the uh, with the waking world. Regarding the realist objection that the impression uh, should be without determination in the mental stream of the perceivers, uh, Vasubandhu takes the example of the Buddhist idea of mass hallucinations experienced in hell by the inhabitants of hell. Now, all these inhabitants of the hell see the guardians of the hell at the same places and times. They share similar experiences of suffering brought about by the guardians of the hell, even though there are no guardians of hell. And lastly, to counter the causal efficacy argument, Vasubandhu says that just as our dreams have causal efficacy, our waking life too has it. Don't we get scared in dreams and wake up uh, sweating? So, this is how Vasubandhu successfully defends his theory. So, this much for today. Thank you so much.